Very good. So thank you everybody for getting up on the last morning of the conference, uh, relatively early, to attend this panel, uh, which is on trust. Um, and I'm so glad you, you made it because, as you can see, we've got an absolutely stellar panel here, which um, probably needs no introduction, but they tell me I have to introduce them, so uh, I shall do so now. Um, Adam Matthews from Church of England Pensions Board. Elaine Doward King, multiple um, non-exec roles, including uh, Ken Marr and Sabanye Stillwater now. Alison Atkinson from Anglo-American uh, Global Projects Director. Carl Weatherall, uh, and of course, Roe from ICMM, who um, perhaps needs uh, certainly uh, the least introduction in terms of the context of a discussion around trust. So I'm, again, it's uh, uh, typical to introduce the topic. Again, we, I think we all understand uh, um, the importance of trust in the mining industry, but the, the man um, who's studied it most recently and leads the ICMM uh, efforts to uh, address this issue is Ro. So over to you, a very general question initially. What is trust and why does it matter? I think the way to think about trust is probably what uh, Steve Martin, an expert on trust and author, says trust is, which is our confidence in the ability to predict the actions of somebody in the future. So how confident can you be in how I'm going to behave in the future? It's really what trust is, and that explains why politicians who consistently lie are trusted. Because you expect them to lie, so they continue to lie. It works, doesn't it? And the challenge I suppose we have is if you expect a, if you ask a local community to anticipate the actions of a mining company, depending on what they may have heard or experienced in the past, you could get very different answers. Mm -hmm. Some might say, well, actually, I expect this company to behave really responsibly because I've seen them do that in the past. Or I've heard enough stories of companies not doing the right thing that I actually am not sure or I'm going to expect the worst. Now, what has been our response traditionally to this problem? It's been essentially to tell people either you're stupid because you think mining is really dark, dumb, and dangerous when it's really high tech and safe and responsible. The reality is both are true. People who believe that mining is the worst industry on earth and people who believe that mining is the best industry on earth are both right because there are parts of our industry that are here and there are parts of our industry mm -hmm. that are here. The other thing we've traditionally done is said to people, yes, 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 you may not like us, but you need us. And our current narrative is all about that. It's to say there's no energy transition without metals and minerals. And I think that's a mistake, because every industry has a, what I like to call, a without us, you're screwed story, right? Uh, fertilizer people will tell you, without us, you'll go hungry. Plastics people will tell you, without us, your food would rot. We tell people, without us, you can't have iPhones. Does that make anybody trust you anymore? Mm -hmm. I think it makes people trust you less yeah. because they end up thinking that you're holding me ransom to the bad stuff that I think you're doing. So my final thought would be, if we can focus slightly less or at least alongside telling people you need us and instead of getting to a place where we want people to think they need mining, mm -hmm. let's try and get people to a place where they want mining. It's a difference between needing something and wanting something. It's a tall order, but I think that's the way we've mm -hmm. got to go. Very good, thank you. I'd like to go to Elaine now as a um, experienced mining executive. What is the mining exec's perspective on trust? Thank you for the question, and it's good to be here and good to see everyone the, this morning. You know, I think when you think about why mining executives should care about whether they have the trust of their stakeholders and CEOs in particular, you know, sometimes it's, I don't think it's 100% um, transparent or core to the way of the, what most mining executives are thinking about every day. But in fact, to be a trusted partner and to have trusted relationships with your key stakeholders is one of the most important enablers for a business executive to be able to deliver on their business strategy and deliver on their business plans. If you don't have an element of trust, whether it's at the local level, the regional level, or the national level, with your communities, with your regulators, with other aspects of civil society, it's going to be much more difficult for us to be able to develop uh, a new asset 
in a timely and cost-effective way because we, mm -hmm. we won't be able to build on, on what people know about us and believe about us. We won't be as, as able to um, expand our business and grow our business because we haven't built any trust about how we operate and how we do things. And we won't be able to attract the brightest and the best mm -hmm. to come work in our industry if we're not seen as, a, as, as people who deliver on their promises. Mm -hmm. I guess the way I think about trust is you, know, you build trust not by giving people facts, but by doing what you say you're going to do and delivering on your promises. And you know, mining executives need to under, understand that if they don't do that, they actually won't be able to achieve the business goals that, that, that they have set forth for their organization. Very good. Yeah. Um, so Ro, I'm gonna leap on something that you raised a moment ago about the um, you need us or you're screwed hypothesis. <laughs> Um, which I certainly um, frequently wave my mobile phone at my children and tell them that they need mining, and they go, so what? Um, Alison, I'd like to ask you if there's a, a, another part of the messaging around um, particularly walking the walk that we need to get across and, and your experience of that. Well, thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here. And Actually, it's my first time at such an event as this, new to mining as I am but coming from an industry actually where we had the same issues in terms of stakeholders and building trust. You know, one of the things that really impressed me um, about part of this industry is about how it really is, you know, walking the talk. And never more so when you see actually in the in knee deep, when you're knee deep in delivering projects and the impacts that you have in developing these, these mines uh, in really quite remote areas, doing it in that really sustainable way, the way that you have described in terms of um, not just doing what you said you would do, but when issues arise, you actually put your communities and your stakeholders before the elements of delivering those projects. Because at the end of the day, and if you look at where our project Kiveco was, you know, when um, issues occurred where we really needed the communities with us, that's where we listened really hard and we didn't just pay lip service to them. We sat down around the dialogue table and really understood what it was they were worried about. And they were really worried about what was going to happen to their water. It was already scarce. And the main industry there is agriculture. So how are they going to maintain that? And with the mine coming through, what does that mean for my family and the next generation of skills? And do they have a future with what that's coming through? And you know, uh, and quite, I think, um, I think really bold and brave, mm -hmm. they stopped the project. The company, the executives stopped the project, sat down and really looked to understand how to solve those issues so that both the community and the development could, go, could, could work hand in hand and go, go, go together. And we redesigned the project. We used the environment, we cleaned up. Now I think that's all well and good when you're looking to get something done. But when you really walk the talk is when, when crises happen and you go beyond, and if you think about COVID, and you go beyond what you would do you know, the volunteering of the, of the, the site-based staff to actually go and work with the communities. So you become an organisation that is a developer um, that supports the region, not just an a, a organisation that mines. And I think that's where the industry can really go, where they're supporting the network of all aspects of all people who are involved in actually that community of which mining is just one. And I think Kiveco has really stood the time in demonstrating that. And if we as an industry can take the lessons from that and move it on, I think that's where we start to move from. We, we don't want you to actually, we really, quite, we, we really do want you. Uh, and as, as a follow on to you, um, what do you think the, the role of um, one of my favorite mining projects in construction, Woodsmith, <laughs> is in terms of demonstrating to people what a 21st century low impact mine looks like. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's really exciting uh, at Woodsmith where if you, if you ever go up to the site, you'll see it looks like a bunch of farm buildings. 
you know, it's all underground. You know, the, the shaft is being, being developed um, sort of you know, a kilometre into where the mineral is and it will be transported under a national park which has been permitted out to the port where it will then be distributed, distributed processed and distributed um, with absolutely limited impact on the environment. Actually better than that for the community, which is quite a poor part of the UK, the jobs and the skill sets that are coming through. And as uh, and we were talking about this earlier, weren't we? Um, I come from, um, uh, I, uh, my grandparents were in mining in Wales. And actually when you think of the legacy that we no longer have, but we do have actually uh, in, the, in the UK and actually what we've been able to rebuild in terms of mining capability, different, but it's a mining capability, is something actually we should be proud of. Um, but that, I think, I believe, particularly is the way of the future mining. It will be underground, limited environmental impact, and really looking at uh, technology and skills, new technology, and also um, uh, wasteless. You know, how do you reuse that full, full mm -hmm. um, uh, circular economy? And, and actually, we're obligated to do that, I believe, given where we yeah. are. Thank you. I'd like to turn to Carl now. Carl, we were talking earlier about the, um, the aspects, particularly of the critical minerals scene where um, the supply chains are becoming ever more integrated and we're seeing, for example, uh, the role of uh, OEMs um, reaching up the supply chain uh, towards uh, mining companies and the tensions that that creates and also the work of your company, Rethink Mining and technology's role in addressing the trust issue. I, I wonder if you'd like to expand on that, please. Yeah, cool. And I'd like to address two things that were said before, something Allison said, and then I'll something yeah. build on what Rhodes said, and then jump on the technology piece. First, the mine of the future, zero. Yeah. It's zero tailing, zero energy, zero. zero water. That's where it is, period, end of story, yeah. right? And we're aspiring to do that, and you know, ICMM has done that with your uh, zero tailings roadmap as well. Um, and Ro, what you talked about is the confidence that somebody has, but what we really have to understand about trust is, is that it's a human emotion, it's an emotion, it's psychology, it's a cognitive reaction to something external. Whether it's an individual you're talking to, you're shaking hands with, to a company, to actions, whatever it is, it's very human. And when we're trying to build trust or when we break trust, it's because we're, we're tugging at the hearts and minds of individuals. And then that can actually accelerate and turn into entire communities. And in our case, you know, why don't you like us? It's turned into basically the rest of the world, but it's very humanistic. It's a human interaction piece. And on the technology side, so I'm, I'm a bit of the oddball here. I've been doing a consortium with industry and multiple industries for 35 years, getting people to work together and trust each other. Mm. And in the mining industry, if you take a look at it, we talk a lot about the trust externally. So, you know, the external environment and the trust we have, we don't have there. But we also have trust within the industry that is, that is missing a little bit. I'll, I'll jump into the technology mm -hmm. piece in a second. So within mining companies, within individual companies, there's some elements of trust that are missing. And something Elaine said, like the intent, it's the authenticity. Right? When, when our CEOs are talking, and being a CEO of two organizations, I make it very clear like we're authentic in what we're saying and what we're doing. There's an authenticity piece. And if a CEO of a company, whether it's mining or something else, talks about something, and, and mm -hmm. you, you know it's not genuine or authentic, you, mm -hmm. you're done. And mm -hmm. that happens within a company. We've seen that, we've heard that from individual companies. Between mining companies as well. This, it's funny, I had a discussion earlier this month with, uh, with a couple of mining companies that are working collaboratively on the technology. One of the companies went behind somebody else's back, closed it down, took off, so their collaborator couldn't take advantage of that technology. Like a massive lack of trust right there. But when you're in consortia between uh, mining companies, like it takes a while to build that trust so you can actually share things, share data, and it can happen really quickly. And, and once that happens, it accelerates. And that's a huge piece about why trust is important because everything we do happens at the speed of trust. Mm -hmm. Our business happens at the speed of trust. Mm -hmm. Innovation happens at the speed of trust. Technology development happens at the speed of trust. And then on the supply chain side, back to your original question, I'll eventually get there, <laughs> is, is that there's a bit of a mistrust here between, for example, um, large suppliers and mining companies. Right? The, there's a huge push now with the, with the mining industry to go to vendor agnostic or OEM agnostic. 
because we're tired of having the OEMs or large vendors say you're, you're, you're stuck with our fleet. Everything you do has to, it's like a Microsoft or Apple conversation. We're seeing the same thing. But also in the startup side, when you go down the chain to the startups, there's a, there's a bit of a challenge there between startups and mining companies and startups and OEMs. I was at a, at a session in New York um, in October with, uh, it was actually Anglo-American, BHP, uh, Glencore, and, uh, and Rio Tinto with a bunch of startups. And the startups were stating to us, we don't trust you, you're going to steal our IP. And on the OEM side, you've got, you've got um, the, the small startups uh, worried, about, uh, worried about working with the OEMs because you're gonna take a really disruptive technology, shelve it, for the detriment of the industry. One of the technologies we're commercializing right now, we're not gonna work with the OEMs yeah. because one of them had said, we're gonna shelf it because you're gonna compete with our technology. So there, there's, there's some trust issues across the entire supply chain. It sounds pretty draconian and pretty dark, but it, it's, it's not that bad. It, it, it is changing, but it's taking a lot of work to get there. But there, there's issues across the entire spectrum of mining. So that's a really interesting perspective, the lack of trust within the industry as well as yeah. between the industry and those yeah. affected by it. And I'd like to get to Adam at this point and get a better understanding on what are the investors thinking? What's their perspective on this? Well, I, I mean, trust, I, I mean, look, I really welcome the fact that um, Roe, ICMM have been very openly put in trust as something on the agenda that needs to be built, the importance of it recognised, the complexity of how you build trust or rebuild trust and equally how easy it is to lose it. Um, and then thinking through the ways in which the industry needs to really be quite different if it's going to establish the trust to do what we need it to do. Um, because it's got some very difficult challenges ahead in terms of yeah. meeting the demand side but also meeting the decline side. And so I think trust is going to be critical to that. And then what's the intersection with investors and that is that well we many of us are the ultimate owners of many of these companies and the providers of capital to to the sector and unless we can have trust and faith that the sector is going to do it to the, the standards that we would expect then that's going to be a very difficult dynamic and i think the trust that needs to be built for the sector to get to where it needs to be um, is going to be critical but that's going to be dependent on a whole raft of other people having trust in, in that path as well. And so I, th I think investors really, as, as a group, probably the, the single most recent event that really shook us was, as we all we've talked about many times with other things, was, was the Brimadino event, where I think there we thought we knew something and the reality was we didn't. And we didn't understand an issue and we thought we could trust that this issue was being dealt with well in terms of management of waste and the reality was we needed something quite different and that required us to recognise that we had been absent um, and actually we have a responsibility, we have a share in the responsibility of being at the table to actually ensure that we are then working collaboratively with others, with the industry but also with other stakeholders in rebuilding the, the foundations that you can then re-establish trust. And that's a journey over time. And part of that's also recognising that you've got to walk with this industry over a long period of time and think in those kind of decadal time frames if you're going to see the change that builds the trust. And so I, I think the, the, the sort of steps we've taken in relation to the issue of tailings waste post that is one way in which we've started to understand that we have a different role um, as, as an investor community as well as providing capital to actually get very involved and sort of roll up the sleeves and work on very difficult issues. But I also just want to go back to one of the points in terms of, it's, I'm looking forward to visiting Woodsmith in terms of seeing that mm. mine of the future in reality happening in a place that you wouldn't assume that regulation would have allowed or that you would have had local opposition and actually you've got quite the reverse. It's been enabled and it's got a footprint that's been well managed and the perception is that this is really good. I'm looking forward to seeing and touching and experiencing that with fellow investors to see how it can be done. Um, but that means that we can see the, the sort of the mind of the future in, in front of us and I know that there's other places in the world um, but it's great to see that in, in the UK. But then it's like well okay then where we are where are we with the rest of the mining that's today operating we know what we could see as the future being rolled out 
but also how to deal with the legacy mm. because mm. unless we have that point on legacy up front recognized as part of how this industry's future trust is built and maintained we've got to deal with that part because that will continually undermine trust and again i know you're not supposed to talk about another conference when you're at somebody else's conference but <laughs> the, the 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 icmm conference where we had the panel on mine closure and uh, looking at um, life of mine etc i think that was a really powerful conversation around recognizing there's a big issue here we all know it in the industry um, and actually we need to be thinking about how do we deal with that legacy issue um, and how do we sort of deal with some of the more challenging elements of that where there's parts of legacy that are transferred out of control of companies but actually we all have a stake in trying to find solutions for some of the issues that they still pose and I do feel that that's going to be really important to build trust and investors again are an important actor in that alongside all the other stakeholders. Yes I, I couldn't agree more and I, I do a lot of work in um, Eastern Europe where there's a, a lot of legacy that uh, you can point to the mind of the future and communities can point to the legacy all around them. <clears throat> and thanks for mentioning tailings as well. I, I think um, what has been set in motion with tailings uh, is um, a remarkable change after so many decades of inaction on tailings. So uh, I remember um, in, the, um, in 2016, it was the 50th anniversary of the Aberfan disaster. Mm. And at the same time, you know, you could point that the industry was still doing this 50 years later. And so pleased to see that the tide is beginning to turn on that. Um, I'd like to uh, talk about um, whether the mining industry has anything to learn from other industries. And uh, Ro, you alluded to a piece of work that uh, you've been leading on ranking of trust of different industries where mining sits and what there might be to learn from other industries who've improved their ratings. I don't know if you'd like to talk a bit about that. Sure. It's uh, work done by Globescan, which is a um, Canadian polling company, who asked um, 30,000 people in 30 countries to rank sectors on the extent to which they fulfill their responsibilities to society. Somebody likes to guess where mining was. Yep. We were last. And we've been last or thereabouts for the better part of 20 years. So in there lies probably one lesson. What's the definition of insanity again? Keep doing the same things and expecting it <laughs> results. And so one thing that's not from other sectors, or let me just say there are two things that I, is not what's going to help us build trust. The first is to tell our story better. How many times have we heard that? It's like going into another country, speaking a foreign language, nobody understands you, and you just speak louder the same language. So for us to tell our story better assumes people are dumb and stupid and need to be educated, this word that often is used again, very paternalistic, they're stupid, we need to educate them. That's not at all how people change their minds. People change their minds when they feel psychologically safe to be curious about mm -hmm. something that they care about. And so the closest thing that I think works to telling our story better is getting others to tell our story for us. But why on earth would anybody go and bat for mining? What have we done to give them the confidence to want to go and bat for us? So it's not about telling our story better. The other thing it's not about is saying we're the good ones, the big companies, and it's all those small miners that are causing the reputational and trust damage in the industry. Really? The worst tailing disaster in modern history, probably the most high profile corruption case, and probably the worst case of cultural destruction, all happened amongst the good part of the industry. So please, pot kettle here. Let's not do any of those things. <laughs> Final thought on what we can learn from other sectors. Yeah. Take airlines. Tragically, planes still crash. But when planes crash, we all don't stop getting on another plane because we have the confidence that the airline industry will learn from what happened and will publicly learn. Our industry is very good at learning in private and promoting in public. If that doesn't change, and if we continue to learn in private and promote in public, people aren't going to trust us. So we know that we've learned the lessons of Brumidinho. The industry is fundamentally different today as a result of it. Would others have the confidence that that's happened? I think so, probably because of the process that Adam instigated mm -hmm. together with us on the global industry standard on tailings. Mm -hmm. But how many of the other issues have we learned publicly through? Only when we learn publicly, like the way the airline industry does, mm -hmm. do I think we can establish trust. Very final point, 
Adam's too magnanimous to say it, but I think one of the things that has happened, which I really think can help move us along to the point about others telling our story for us, is the Global Investor Commission. Mm -hmm. And Adam can say a little bit more about it, but it's helping investors build a consensus view on what good looks like in the industry and what we need to do to get there. That is really valuable and something that complements what the industry is trying to do, but it's not led by the industry, mm -hmm. which is what makes it good. Very good. Adam, you, um, Ro mentioned you there and invited you to come in. look pre I mean, <laughs> <laughs> but, well, look, I, I mean, as I say, I think investors have got to understand this, this industry very differently. We've got to reflect in the way that we invest, we provide capital to it, the time scales over which we do that, and, and the role that we have in actually realising the industry to be the best it can be. Because we know that good practice exists, and, and we know that there's a lot of commitment amongst individual executives, etc. But the reality is that if we're going to get to where we need to be, I think we've got to think very differently about the role that we play. And so the commission, um, which there's a session um, in, in a little bit further with Rory Sullivan and myself on, on that, where we go a bit more into detail around it, is really been sort of established to, to provide that opportunity to step back, to think around the role of investors, to really look at how do we ensure it's not just about enabling a small group of, a small group of companies, albeit significant, to be the best, it's actually the whole industry but also to look at some of the more challenging issues around the intersection with artisanal mining, the, the relationship with conflict as well, and understanding mm -hmm. our role in that context, and I think that's the opportunity. Okay, very good. I've, I've got one more question before we um, go to the audience. I just wanted to invite the other panellists to, I can see Carl to, uh, to add to that. Yeah, I had a couple of things. One related to the investment side of things. Uh, we've had a couple of investors talk to us about um, the mining industry and, tech, and the link to technology. And it comes back to something Elaine and I were talking about in the back is that there's a spectrum, a continuum of how, for example, the mining companies look at ESG, for example. There's some that are, it's strategic to our company, and at the other end is it's a fad, don't talk to us, it's gonna go away. And what some of the investors are actually doing is that they're looking at the, the authenticity, the, the technology spend the mining companies are actually doing to solve some of their big problems as an indicator of how, how uh, invested they really are in ESG. So it's really interesting. A conference in Montreal last May, four investors sitting on a panel like this, and they basically said, the industry's greenwashing. We don't trust you. Like four investors saying you're mm -hmm. greenwashing. And they're using t technology as a, as a segue into trying to try and, uh, take a look at that. Something else Rose said, I, I love what you said, it's not, it's the, we can't point fingers at, the, at everybody else, it's us as well. So it's really interesting because there's, I don't know if anybody's seen this, there's an online tailings database, tailings failures database, somebody's been collecting this, this uh, data for, uh, since 1961. Mm -hmm. Guess what the trend looks like? The tailing stamp failures historically is going up. It's not going down, it's going up. So as an industry, we talk about while we're addressing issues, somebody who doesn't know us looks at publicly available information that we have not curated, they see that and they say, I don't trust you, you're full of crap. So we've got to be very careful about, about how we do these things and, and how the external environment, our stakeholders and even just kids that we're trying to recruit look at us, because yeah. they're looking at data like that, we're not curating. But can I, yeah. but can I come on back That's to right. I just wanted to give Elaine a Oh, sorry, I apologize for <laughs> doing that That's terrible right. thing. <laughs> well, I just wanted to make a few comments since we're talking about, you know, building trust. And we've been talking about this for a very yeah. long time. Um, you know, and so w in addition to acting on the things that we say, the values that we say we have, which I think is fundamental, you know. It's keeping your promises, it's, it's doing things, not just talking about it. But I think it's also important for us to consider, you know, how we go about having conversations, building relationships. You know, data, we've already said, you know, just educating people is not enough, you know. And CEOs always think, they can just give people more information and do a PR campaign and surely they will understand. We know that's not enough. But it's also many of us that are the leaders in the mining sector come from a pretty homogeneous worldview. And I think sometimes we approach our relationships and our trust building with a, a view that we, we actually do know what's right 
and we will listen to you, but we really do know the way we need to go. So I think being a little more humble <laughs> in how we regard our worldview and the um, understand the expectations and the needs of others that we want to build trust with is something we need to continually reflect on. You know, there are many different ways of looking at the world. There are different um, cultural expectations and values that may not be the same that a lot of us that have been Western educated and grown up in the West and are leading the, the mining companies. You know, th there's a different worldview that's just as legitimate as some of the, the worldview that we have. So I think being more culturally sensitive in how we develop relationships and seek to be partners, whether that's at the community level, whether it's with civil society, whether it's with, um, uh, at the broader global scale, is something that I think the, the mining sector would do well to reflect on. Are we truly respectful of those that we're trying to have relationships with, truly respectful? And do we convey that in not what we say, but how we behave in the decisions that we make, whether it's to invest in technology, whether it's to invest in a zero emissions mine, or whether it's to do local uh, economic development. How we do it's just as important as what we do. Okay, very good. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I completely just you agree come in with, and with one last um, what you've just said, and I. And I also, the previous part I was going to make was time. It, it's, it's about how you change over time. And like the issue of, of tailings and get into a position that we are confident that this has been well managed, that communities that live next to the tailings can have confidence. That's going to take an enormous amount of time. But we've put in place the building blocks to get there. Agreed. And so I think it will take time to get to a point that we can really say that this issue has been properly managed. And I, and I think we've got to also be, and I think one of the most challenging elements of that new standard was the social element, the social pillar, where companies were really challenged to sort of engage communities around the facilities. And some of them did do that already, but actually, actually these are the kind of expectations around how this is done to the level of the standard I know has been really challenging. And I welcome the fact that the companies have done that, but it is going to take time. And we also need different ways of having dialogues. I think the dialogue process that I know your company is part of, Anglo part of in South Africa, where you have different convenings under mm -hmm. Archbishop of Cape Town across the faith groups with companies, with unions, with civil society, is creating space for some of that very different kind of discussion and challenge around some of these issues that ultimately will lead to the building of trust. Okay, thank you. And one last question, which I'm gonna ask the panel, and then I'm gonna ask the audience. Same question. Um, we talk a lot about young people and the level of disengagement in the industry. Um, how do we get younger people, uh, why do we need to get younger people more engaged and how do we do it? And uh, I'll give you first shot, Alison, as uh, you were talking about your discussions with your children. Uh, uh, my own internal focus group. Yes. Who are 14, 20 and 22 and have very strong views, I can tell you. Um, you know, the next generations have choice, right? Uh, they really do. In my old company, we used to talk about the, um, the competition between mining on Mars and doing nuclear processing, right? And the mining on Mars is really, really exciting. So how do you turn what we do here into something that's actually going to do good for the energy transition? And uh, technology, I think, is a real part of the way because it not just develops the zero waste mine, it actually leads into and drives into the skills uplift. And with skills moving from, tra from, from trade, real trade, into tech, you know, it just builds economic zones, it just builds that development area that you have in some of, the, some of the areas of the world that wouldn't necessarily have had the investment there without the um, mining, um, historical mining over the many, many generations that I've had before. And people are scared about that, I think. And I think as an industry, we have to talk much more openly about the opportunities that come with that, because without those technical skills for the modern ways of mining that supports the energy transition, that addresses our biggest fundamental issue, which is climate change, and I do fundamentally believe in that, um, then I think that's an opportunity we should talk more about. But it does require us to be very overt <coughs> and build that conversation as we do 
with the, um, so the society contract, the social contract that we have today in, our, in the way that we're developing and progressing our minds. Um, I'm really passionate about that because I think it just opens up this industry to a wealth of talent that, is around, that uh, wouldn't normally, normally address it. Thank you. Anyone else want to come in on that? Yeah, just a couple of things. I, I want to go back to something Andrew said, or Adam said, is we don't have time. Yes, it's going to take a long time. We need to accelerate what we're trying to do, mm -hmm. and we need to learn from other industries, leaning on what Rohit said. How have other industries done this? We need to take the best of the best from other industries and apply it to accelerate. In terms of um, the next generation, the simplest way to get to the next generation is go down to their level. When was the last time the CEO of a mining company went into a public school in jeans and t shirt and said, we need your help. Well, we're going to do our best on that in a moment, actually. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I can't see a clock, so I don't know. About One here, you're four minutes. Five minutes. Four minutes. OK, a bit of a pl Sorry, I have to do mine. I no, no, really no. like to go to the audience. Yeah. The, um, so I w I'd like to try and ask the same question to the audience. But um, so Andrew uh, hasn't, I don't think, made a, a big announcement of this, but you um, the organisers of this conference have taken it upon themselves to give 200 tickets to the conference to students at free of charge, which costs normally about £3,000 a pop. So that's quite a big commitment. There's a, there's a, um, a student speed dating session later on this afternoon. And um, I'm hoping that we have some of the students in the audience. Um, and somebody who can... Sorry to say, nobody here looks like a student. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking around. <laughs> uh, that's lady over there. Uh, Louise. Yes, I think. Uh, no. Um, okay, somebody want to have a go at how do we get more young people engaged in the industry in a positive way? There's a hand at the back over there. There's a lady. There's somebody in the back over there. Hi, Fiona Clare, our ambassador partnership. Um, actually get people up on the stage. So I feel, with all due respect, it's been a really, really great session, but we're all preaching to the converted. Yes. <laughs> so if we want more young people involved, get more young people up on the stage, get young people also from different sectors yes. to do some of that challenge and help us with some of that learning. <coughs> and also bring out the, the industry of the future needs a much wider and different mm -hmm. skill set. Yep. Um, and that will make it a more attractive proposition, I suggest. Very good. I think the first step of that, I can see Andrew writing down for next year for his spot for students on stage. Is that uh, fair to say? Is that what you're writing? I think I can see. Hello. Um, I would challenge anyone with children to offer to go and speak in their school. I've done mm. it myself. I do. Go and talk to the children. Talk about what you do. Talk about geology or mining or you know any aspect of what you do, and just open their eyes a little bit. It's quite a powerful thing to do, even with a bunch of seven-year-olds. Great <laughs> suggestion. And please feel free also to ask questions of the panel. We don't have to just focus on this particular younger people engagement topic. Try to place a mining engineer or a mining related person into a popular TV series. <laughs> <laughs> it, it happened by accident in South Africa, a leading soap opera character was a geologist on a mine and the next year a woman geologist and the next year the uptake of women geology had doubled. <laughs> Very good. There we go. Awesome. <laughs> popular culture saving us all. Hi, Vicente from Wake in Brazil. Uh, I think, you know, suggestion and a question. I, 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 and I get this ties back to trust, you know. Uh, trust is a fundamental pillar of uh, the younger generation, you know, much more than older generations. It's a core value. So by addressing trust, perhaps it's going to facilitate and engage with, with, with young generation. And the question, and, and that's for the panel, you know, we, we heard a lot about the opportunity of the energy transition, uh, how it's going to shape the future and the importance. And, uh, but we continue to replicate a model of the past. Mm. Look for, you know, uh, developing countries to provide the resources, 
build the manufacturing facility in developed countries, keep the low paying jobs in developing countries, high paying jobs in the developed countries. So how can we build trust if we continue to fundamentally replicate the developing models of the past? Which, who would like to <coughs> take that? Well, I think one of the things we can do is start to build some of the standards infrastructure in the South. I think mm. um, ensuring that we've, we are working on the different issues to ensure that there's that capacity in, in countries that are producing. I also think we've got to look at the, yeah, I mean, taking it out of the ground and the processing element. And I think there's all those intersections we've got to really have a think about quite clearly. And the other point I just wanted to make on the question of, is I have a question to Omos, like, how are we as an industry, how is the industry recognizing that talent that it needs for the future? And how is it collaborating across the industry to ensure that we've got those pipelines? And I, and I know it goes to trust as part of the answer in terms of establishing that, but the, it, it, are we joined up in our thinking in terms of the universities that working across the world to provide that? And how, how can we sort of th rethink that approach as well, um, combined with that wider outreach that needs to happen? Um, to Lane's point, I, dare I say that this um, sense of crisis about lack of mm -hmm. talents and interest in the industry is again a very Western-centric point of view. Mm -hmm. There are plenty of Indians, Africans, Latin Americans that would happily work in mining companies in parts of the world that we all live and work in. So can, if we are serious about it, then let's play an active role in having yep. an immigration policy that allows brown and black people opportunities mm -hmm. to work in parts of the world that they otherwise wouldn't get. That would solve the talent problem for us if that's all we care about, but it'd also be a source of equity. The second thing that everybody can do, it'll cost you 20 bucks, but pro I promise you it'll make a difference. Go onto Amazon, search for a book called Anna's Adventures of the Mine. <laughs> Anna, would you please just... Anna is the author of Anna's Adventures at the Mine. It's a book aimed at people between the ages of 8 and 13 to talk about what the world of mining can be, and the central character is Anna, a girl. And so buy that book, either for your own kids or gift it to somebody who does have kids. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, I didn't realize I, I've got your um, uh, flyer in my pocket. So I'm <laughs> go and seek you out. Anna. Thank you. Do we have time for one more? Uh, thank you very much. Um, going on from the last comment that you made, I live in um, I live in Philippines and uh, I work in Tasmania, so I'm a bit all over the place. I'm on the lecture circuit economic geology in Philippines, and recently I got up and gave a lecture to 80 of them, and they wanted to learn about economic geology. But actually, what I realised that they really wanted to know is how to get involved in the business that we're in, and be able to contribute. So having given them a sort of perspective of how we do everything all over the world. I asked for questions, and the first question they asked was, well, how can we get into your country? Because most of the time, you can't get the immigration policy yeah. to get something. Bear in mind that a lot of these kids, particularly in the University of Philippines, which is the top-ranked university, they still don't have the finances to be able to go and study overseas, even if they wanted to. So there's a, there's a desire to do it, but they just don't really have the capacity to be able to do it. And there's 80 of them, of which 60% were females. Yeah. yeah. Good point. OK, I think, uh, are we out, out of time, or? Yeah, OK, no worries. <laughs> Thank you, panelists. That was absolutely brilliant, um, as I knew it would be. So. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you, thank so you much. very much to the panelists. <laughs>